I've seen a study that concluded men's testosterone levels since the 80s has dropped significantly in comparison with men in modern days. What would you say is... Simple, two things. People are eating far more processed rubbish now than they've ever done, ever. That's the first point. Secondly... Wow, how true is that? There's a correlation between the healthy you are, the more money you're gonna make. Achieving a strong body teaches you resilience, patience, not having instant gratification. What you learn through training exercise is just a small percentage of it, 20% of it. Irrespective of what social media tells you, bodybuilders aren't healthy. You might look great from the outside, but internally you're shot, you're tired, you're fatigued. Let's stay on that. You mentioned it's not healthy. Give me some details. What, you, yeah. what are you talking about? Low libido. Right, that's okay. a big one. What's the script with PEDs? It's a, it's a good question. And I'll be open and honest about it, I think. Welcome to another episode of the Tai Kamo podcast, the number one platform for sharing stories worth telling. So if that's your kind of jam, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Bro, I'm super pumped to have you on, man. And thank you so much for coming all the way from Huddersfield, man. I had no idea you were outside of Manchester. <laughs> so massive respect for you, brother. Um, and we've got a lot of juicy topics to get into today. Um, we're going to provide you guys with immense value from someone who has been in the industry for almost 15 years, um, has been an online coach for the past seven years. Um, so a lot of information to extract, man, and I can't wait to dive in. I look forward to it. Yeah, man. Um, but to start with, just in case someone hasn't come across your content, what is Strictly Body Gains and how did it all start? So Strictly Body Gains is essentially an online transformation uh, platform for, to help everyday people to get in the best shape of their lives, irrespective of where they are, what position they're in and it's just everyday people to be honest just want them to feel better look better and essentially be the most confident and the best version of themselves so in terms of where it started from it actually started going back just over six six years ago now um even prior to that to be honest i used to help a lot of family and friends they'd come up to me all the time since like, can you help me with this can you put together a nutrition plan for me can you help me with a training program with a supplement plan yeah and this is over the space of probably about three or four years and it was quite consistent and this happened all the time i remember even one of my first workplaces we used to have like so i'd write out the training the nutrition plan and the check-in so we'd bring the scales in yeah. on a weekly basis like eight ten of us and this is before you started this is actual... way before yeah, yeah this is this is way before the other so 2013 wow. and um yeah and i think it just became the norm where if somebody wanted to train a nutrition plan they'd go to sakib like right. within my within my own immediate network and with even outside of that network as well. And then I think it was probably about four or five years after that, I thought, you know what, I've been doing this for a long time. Why don't I actually just turn this into an actual business? And that's kind of where it originated from, to be honest. I thought if I've been able to help family and friends within my own network, am I able to branch out and actually help more people, both yeah. nationally and globally, inshallah. That's amazing, man. It sounds like you've always been into fitness though. Uh, I have, to be honest, I've been into sport my whole life. Yeah. Like, me and my younger brother, we played sports from probably the time that we were five, six years old up until, even up until now, I was playing tennis with him last week. And, um, but yeah, I love like, sport has probably been one of the key fundamentals of, in my life from a, from a young age. Cricket was probably one of the biggest ones when I was yeah. growing up, yeah, yeah. being Pakistani. Yeah. Cricket was, uh, <laughs> yeah, you want, you want Pakistani without, without, yeah. uh, without having an element of cricket inside of you. And, um, yeah, it was cricket, football, and even up until, I'd say I probably properly found fitness itself probably when I was about 18 years old. And okay. This is, we're talking specifically bodybuilding now. Yeah, I'd say more into the bodybuilding uh, front. Naturally, I was very, very skinny, very slim. I was oh, really? probably, I'll have to show you some more pictures. Yeah, it's there. unbelievable right yeah. now, because looking at you right now, bro, you're a unit, man. You're barely fitting in that chair, man. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I probably started off at around about 10 stone. Um, right. And I think at the time when I first started off, I just wanted to be, just wanted to be massive. And at the yeah. time, training and bodybuilding wasn't really a big thing, especially in the South Asian community, especially in, even within my own immediate area. It, it wasn't really a big thing. And set out, thought, you know what? I just want to be the biggest and strongest. Mm. It, it was a bit of a weird thing, but I just, I just set out to do that. And then I think over the space of about three years, it's a bit of a weird thing, but I went through a phase. I didn't really have any guidance, or there were there was no internet there was no that you could i think there was a few forums and stuff there wasn't there wasn't any actual guidance from people that you knew within your circle to try and help and guide you say right this is what you need to yeah. eat this is how you need to do it this is how you need to train it was almost like learning on the job so you're just winging it yeah he's winging it but, which to be fair a lot of people were yeah that were in this within the same remit but and i remember at the time i was like okay the only way i'm going to grow is by going off the scales 
And I thought, the only way I'm going to go off the scales is by eating more food. Mm. And I went through a phase, I was having 24 Weetabix every single day. Wow. The whole <laughs> box. I remember my mum saying to me, why are you having so much Weetabix? I'd have a full meal. Yeah, yeah. And then straight after the meal, I'd have four Weetabix with every single meal. Looking back at it, that was ridiculous. To be fair, it's better than eating 24 Mackeys though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, probably, you probably won't last very long eating 24 Mackeys, but yeah, yeah, it's 24 Weebix and I probably went through a phase of that probably over the space of about a year. Looking back right. at it, it was just atrocious, yeah. terrible yeah. idea. Yeah. But no, no, one, no one could tell me otherwise. It was just like, well, you just keep doing that. Keep looking at the scales, keep growing, keep, keep getting bigger. Did you, because you mentioned like, you don't know why you got into bodybuilding, but did you take any inspiration from the classic guys, Arnold, all them kind of guys? Uh, who didn't? You know, you watch Terminator, you watch Rambo. Exactly. Like that was the, that was like, for me, that was like the ultimate era in terms yeah. of having idols and inspirations in terms of what a complete physique looked like. They looked unbelievable. unbelievable. Far better than the, the guys look like today. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah. they look, no offense to them, most of them look absolutely terrible, but they had such a beautiful physique. It was amazing. Um... And to be fair, alongside that, my dad actually used to train. Oh, really? Yeah, my dad used yeah. to train. Um, and he's looking back at it now, he's unbelievably strong. Like, very, very strong. I remember we went to Pakistan and he'd have his own little gym in the village. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, yeah, it was amazing. So you took uh, some inspiration from your dad as well? Yeah, I think even now, looking back at it now, even sometimes I wrestle with my dad. And my dad, mashallah, is, he's what, circa 60, mid-60s now? Mashallah. Still unbelievably strong. Very, yeah. very strong. And to be fair, looking back at it, he was... He was probably someone that I, in terms of physique wise, he was he was always not sure very very strong naturally anyway. But he, I, alongside obviously the idols that you see on TV and so forth, and alongside my dad, I think it was I think it was a combination of all of them to be honest. Hundred percent. Arnold was the man though, growing up on his movies, man. Like he's 100%. he's at the blueprint. Like he did something phenomenal. Like he branched out into movies as well 100%. with his accent, his build that was unheard of at that I'll time. Be back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get to the chopper, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then um, he paid the way for like people that like the Rock today. Do you know what I mean? Hundred percent. Who can do movies now? Do you yeah, know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, well, Rock's the highest paid actor in the world, yeah. isn't he at the moment? Yeah. And to be fair, if you have a look at the original. It stemmed from Marnie. I think at the time he was the highest paid actor in the world in the yeah. late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah. So yeah, for me that was that, that was the ultimate physique. It was amazing, amazing physique. Who? Because you, you mentioned there, the modern guys are rubbish, right? Who I wouldn't say they're rubbish. I just yeah. think their physiques aren't as quite as, as aesthetic as some of the guys from the eighties and nineties. Yeah. yeah, totally Not agree with you. Yeah, totally agree with you. Um, who, who would you say your top three bodybuilders are that you like? That you think, well, for me, it's like maybe is it Frank Zane? Frank Zane, beautiful physique, yeah, amazing physique. Um, I'd Arnold, say, obviously, but then who is your top three? Would you say? I'd say top three of all time, Arnie, Frank Zane would be up there as well. Um, I'm trying to think of the modern, even though it was a bit, it was a bit crazy, and it was nothing like anybody had ever seen. Dory, I actually met him in yeah. Birmingham whilst I was out going back for work, but going back about twelve years ago, eleven years ago. Yeah. And uh, just bumped into him in the street. Did I you? I recognised him. I was like, is that Dorian Yates? I was amazed. I was yeah, amazed. So yeah, I spoke yeah. to him. Really nice guy. He's got his own gym in uh, in Birmingham. And uh, he looks like a different person now compared to obviously how he did yeah. many moons ago. But he was, uh, I think, because it appeared in the, on the premise that no one had ever seen any physique like it at mm. the time, more of a shock factor. But in terms of aesthetics, probably wasn't quite as aesthetic as some of the uh, they, older, they, older they used guys. to call him the shadow, right? Because he used to like disappear during competition time. Oh, sorry, he used, to, he used to appear during competition yeah, time, yeah. but out of season, he was nowhere to be seen. Yeah, yeah, no media presses. Yeah. Guy was just the shadow, was, the yeah, ghost. The and and he would literally document every single training session, yeah. every single meal, every single. Uh, you know, he'd he'd work out every single intricacy of every single day, and essentially it was almost like a building block towards the competition. And he'd automatically appear and then. Blow yeah, everyone yeah. out of the water and to be fair, he's probably the greatest, well, he's the greatest uh, yeah. British bodybuilder of all time. Yeah, 100%, man. So just to summarize, like you're always into fitness, yeah? you're always athletic. Yep. Yeah. And you got into bodybuilding around the age of 18, yeah. took inspiration from your dad, as you mentioned, and yeah. obviously the classic guys as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's where it sort of started your journey, yeah, yeah. eating 24 wee to fix a day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> man. Um, with sugar. With sugar. Yeah. There we go. Terrible. <laughs> so this, this is what happens when guide well there's no guidance in terms of what you need to eat and how much you need to eat yeah and i was a perfect example i was almost like my own guinea pig you know you're just winging it and then when you're winging it you make mistakes and looking back at it now i think if i did have somebody who could guide me and mentor me at the time i probably would have made that progress in half the time yeah um because i wouldn't have had to bulk which yeah 
Hundred percent. I think that ties nicely in when we talk about it later. You know what you do as well. So that'd be a good topic to talk about. Yeah. Um. One question I did have though is what made you choose to take it to the next level and start competing now? Because that's a sport yeah. where there's intense workout, grueling diet. Yeah. Like you have to take your body percentage fat like below healthy levels let's get yes, real yeah absolutely 100 percent. do you know what i mean so what made you fall in love with that side of things or what made you want to compete what made you want to take it from a casual gym goer to now competing great question um to be honest i this was around covid time and in my yeah. mind it's always something i've i've always toyed with that idea i thought you know what it'd be nice to compete at some point but i never really committed to it 100 percent. and i thought do you know what it was December. I, remember, I still remember it was December time. I remember speaking to my friends about it. Got a few close friends and we had a conversation about it. And there was three of us who all all been trained in our whole lives. We said, right, you know what? Let's collectively do it together. For whatever reason, they weren't unable to do it. And I was like, you know, I've made a commitment to myself. I'm going to see it through. Anyway, lo and behold, this was during the time of the pandemic. And this is the back end of it. And I was thinking, oh, do you know what? We're slowly coming out of the um, lockdown period lockdown. now. Yeah. So if I start prepping now, it was in December 2020, I thought if I look towards getting, start competing in end of March, start of April time. So there was no, just to clarify, there's no real reason, it's just one of those things that you just wanted to do. 100%, yeah, yeah. there was no, there was no, I, I've always, I've always trained my whole life and I've always been known as, you know, Sakibu's a big lad or he's a strong lad or whatever it might be, but everyone's a, a big fish in their own little pond. Yes. And I never wanted to be that guy. I always wanted to be like the guy who, you know, makes a statement and says, right, you know what, rather than challenging myself on a local scale, how do I compare against some of the best guys in the UK on a national scale? Wow. So it's more of a challenge for you. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And, and, you know, I could quite have easily have gone to some of the local shows in Huddersfield, for example, and probably would have won them. But I thought, you know what, that, that there's no real recognition for me. It's more the fact that I want to go in and actually fully challenge myself. If I come last, I'll come last, no problem. But I know for a fact I've given him 100%. Yeah. And if that's not good enough on the day, then that's fine. I can I can come away from that. Got it. So it was more the challenge yourself, see how you get on, and just leave no stone unturned. So that was the just the reason that you wanted to compete. That's simple as that. Simple as that. Just a challenge. Yeah, just a challenge. And I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. And nothing's going to stop me. Wow. Uh, what's, what's impressive, and I don't know if it's your first bodybuilding show, right, is that during lockdown, because you mentioned lockdown there, right? <laughs> um, you got into shape when all the gyms were shut, you had minimal equipment, training from home. Not only did that happen, you went into the competition and placed top three. Yes. How, bro? Okay. Uh, to be fair, looking back at it, it was mental. Absolutely yeah. mental. I, I remember I made, I made the commitment to myself and then I think it was about two or three weeks later, the, we went into another lockdown. I yeah. was like, holy moly. So I've literally been at the gym for like a week and a half. I was like, well, what do I, I've got, either got two options. Either I cancel the competition, yeah, which was still, I still had another like 14, 15 weeks to prepare, or I just go with it. and just yeah. hope that at the time, Borgio pulls his finger out and uh, alleviates some of that pressure and uh, we can get back to... Uh, Normality. No, normality, yeah. Or an element of normality. Anyway, that didn't come. So at the time, I literally had a set of dumbbells. Yeah. I had some resistance, resistance bands. And at the time, my neighbor had um, a barbell. He used to see me work out in the garden. Mm. And um, so he gave me he gave me his barbell. And I, I remember he used to use his barbell. Um, literally had. So how much are we talking in terms of weight? There was probably about, there was two 20 kilo dumbbells, uh, yeah. sorry, two 20 kilo plates, and yeah. there was two 10 kilo plates. And that was it. That's it. That was literally it. And I had dumbbells, um, just, just a normal set of dumbbells. I think they were like, they used to go up to like 15 kilos or 17 and a half kilos. So it was next to nothing. It was so next to nothing. Not like, yeah. Yeah, it was next to nothing. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just try and maximize what I have um, and just run with it. So I did. And at the time, I was like, I was, I was, it, I wasn't struggling as such, but I was like, I need to find a way. Anyway, somebody reached out who actually lived probably about a minute and a half, two minutes down the road. He said, look, Sakib, you can use my home gym. It was essentially his garage. He said, you can use my, you can use my garage. Um, 
have my key. Right. And you can just you could essentially just go in there, use it as a win. So you got a bit of an upgrade in terms of equipment. I did, I yeah. did massively, yeah. nice. massively. So I had, uh, I was able to have a squat rack. I yeah. was able to, I had uh, a wider variety of dumbbells. Yeah, uh, I had a bit more uh, equipment in terms of, uh, you know, just EZ uh, barbell and yeah. things like that. And how far out was you from the competition? So this was about, this was about four weeks in, five weeks in, right, and. Um, <laughs> so it was all five weeks in. I remember I was training there for about two, three weeks. I was training there, so I'd, I'd, I'd have the key, I'd pop in, uh, use the facilities, and essentially leave, leave the key, and then get off. And then one of the days, get a knock on the door. I was like, that doesn't sound like my friend. Mm-hmm. Open the door. It's the police. I thought, like, what are you doing here? Is it your promise? Is it, is it your house? I was like, nope, it's not my house. They were like, you're not allowed to be here. I was like. But I'm not actually interacting with anybody else. I'm not training with anybody else. I'm literally just training here. And I said, I'm training for a competition. Yeah, yeah. He couldn't give a monkeys. He, right. He didn't care. He was like, this isn't your house. You need to leave. I was like, but I'm not actually interacting with anybody. Like, there's no human interaction, nothing. Yeah. He wasn't bothered. He said, yeah. if you get caught here again, you'll get fine. And that was the end of that. So then I went back to the drawing board back again. To, back to the back drawing to board. Home. <laughs> back to home. Back to training with... Uh, minimal equipment again, and then just trying to maximize as best as I possibly could. And then I remember my father gave me a, he gave me a spin bike. Mm. Um, the seat had broken, and it was and at that time. <laughs> I don't know if you remember during COVID time, trying to source equipment, home equipment, gym yeah, equipment, yeah. was nigh on impossible. Yeah. You just couldn't get equipment from anywhere. So I remember I used to spin, use the spin bike every single morning. Wake up at six o'clock in the morning. I do my hour card, hour cardio in the morning. Get it done with no seat. The seat was, <laughs> when I say it was a pain in the ass, I mean literally it was literally. a pain in the ass. It was literally a pain in the ass. And then I remember I'd have to do my cardio in the morning and I'd have a sort of bum. Mm. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't enjoyable. And then um, that was essentially my only use of equipment throughout, in, from a cardio standpoint. I used that same essentially broken bike through the whole prep of, initially started off as I think it was about a 14 to 16 week prep. In the end, it turned out to be a 20 week prep. Right, um, and I'll talk through that in terms of what that looked like. I had a competition date. Yeah, yeah. That had been penciled in. I think it was the end of March, and then because obviously we were going through weird and unprecedented times. I hate that word, unprecedented times. That date kept getting pushed further and further forward. And when for anybody who's competed and was a bodybuilder and so forth, when you're dieting for a show and you're like four weeks out and you're three weeks out and you're two weeks out and you're trying to prepare for that final week, yeah, it's really really difficult. Yeah. Like it's very, very difficult because mentally you're gone, you're shot. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I remember the date get, kept getting pushed further and further forward. And um, but yeah, Alhamdulillah, when it came to competition time, um, you know, the restrictions had been lifted a week, a week and a half before the competition, the, the restrictions were lifted. Got to go to the gym, absolutely buzzing, had all the equipment in the world. Um, so yeah, pretty much 90% of my prep was then using minimal equipment, literally a barbell, dumbbell. Um, and some resistance. And ones. let's not sugarcoat it. You placed top three as well, man. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. And then and then I placed. I took uh, I took my family with me. It was in the the competition was in London. It was in Maidenhead. Um, so I remember stayed there the night and uh, got up, competed there in the morning. There was no visitors allowed. We were still under. It was it was it was, it was a really weird. weird it was yeah, a really yeah, weird yeah, time. Yeah, it was such a yeah. weird time. Yeah. I, I competed, but then no one was allowed. But my family were allowed to watch it on TV. My family and friends were allowed to watch it on TV. I had to pay for. I think it was like a pay-per-view or whatever it was, it was like 10 or 20 quid, I can't remember what it was. Yeah. So my family and my brother and my dad and so forth, they all watched it on uh, on, on television at the, at the, at the yeah. apartment that we were staying at. That's mad. So they, so they travelled all the way <laughs> to London. There. They were there, but they weren't there. But watching you on a screen. Yeah, so weird, <laughs> so, so weird. weird. But alhamdulillah, I placed and alhamdulillah. I remember when I, when I placed, I was so happy. I was yeah. absolutely buzzing. And to be fair, looking back at it, I, I remember speaking to some of the other guys that were that competed on the day and um funny enough even though we were going through the lockdown period they had access to gyms and they, they were quite yeah. open about it they said right. you know we, we had access to a gym and they were like you've not had access to any gym and i was like they were they were genuinely shocked they were like yeah, of course so so nobody ever even lent you their key and so far i was like no and they were like you're st- you've still made it here mm-hmm. and to be fair, i think for me it just gave me that confidence I remember on on that morning it gave me confidence i was like you know i'm up against guys that have been had access to a gym throughout the entirety of that period. Yeah. Rightfully or wrongfully, well, that, that was down to them. But ultimately, so it, it wasn't necessarily a level playing field, but I was buzzing. I was like, you know what? I've still yeah. made it here and I'm still going to give it my best. And Alhamdulillah, 
placed third, and uh, in hindsight, I probably could have placed him, but I should have, I could have, I could have yeah. won. But it no, is what definitely something to be it proud of, man. Yeah, no, is, honestly, that's amazing. Did you have anyone mentoring you then? For that whole process, did you have a mentor, um, or was it just again you was winging it yourself? Or I was gonna say when when I initially started out, I set out pretty much doing it pretty much by myself, yeah. uh, and then I did use uh, uh, a coach uh, in Dubai who had yeah. uh, he had experience with prepping people for, for for competitions and things. Yeah, yeah. So that I think that was a bit of an eye opener as well. You, you uh, need that, bro, man. You, you need like someone to guide you, man. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, 100%. it's very difficult to do things on your own, man. Especially when you've got a big goal, man, like that. Yeah, I think I, I think you can only get so far when you, and I think you're sometimes a little bit too critical when it comes to comes to your own physique and and, and your your look. And sometimes you need to have a second set of eyes to say, right, this is when you need to pull back. This yeah. is when you need to drop the hammer. This is when you need to pull back. And I think it was a really good learning experience, experience for me. And it's actually made me a better coach having somebody yeah. because there was a lot of things that I, I liked. There was a lot of things that I didn't like. Mm. And I thought these are things that I don't want to do as a coach myself. Um, yeah. So from that perspective, it was it was an eye op- eye opening experience, and it was, it was it was really good. It was really good, yeah. uh, not because I had the best coach or anything, but it just uh, there was a lot of things that I thought I don't want to do that as a coach myself in the position. Hundred so. percent. Do you know when you start to diet down to low percentage body fat, and um, people don't realize like it's things not like healthy. that yeah. is not healthy. And on top of that, the mental aspect like the irritability kicks in. You're tired constantly all the time. People don't realize that, that, do you know what I mean? Like you might look great. hundred percent. But in reality, you feel like shit, let's get real. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I think this is what I mean. I think you can, when you're about, I'd say four to eight weeks out from a competition, that is sustainable. That look is sustainable for the rest of your life. Right. When it gets to week four down to week zero yeah. and you're really dieting down, you're getting as lean as possible. That isn't healthy, you yeah. know, and I'll be open and honest, you know, yeah. you're, you're irritable. You're not healthy. You might look great from the outside, but internally you're shot, you're tired, you're fatigued. You're probably not the best person to be around at that moment in time. Yeah, so I think yeah, having a good support yeah. network and having a good support system, mm. especially if you're wanting to compete, is absolutely crucial. Because if you're not, yeah, there's going to be a lot of relationships that you lose on the way to get there. Yeah, and it's not yeah. worth it. Yeah, yeah. There's no relationship with your family or your friends that is worth competing and coming first in ever. Yeah. So what, what got you through those times? Like, did you question yourself, why am I doing this, man? Do you know what I mean? I don't need to do this. <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd say my support network. I yeah. had my immediate family, um, my close friends. Yeah. And just a big shout out to my friend Sav as well. He was yeah. a, a real cornerstone to, and, a, and a, just, a, just a key figure to help me throughout that process as well. Because I think if it wasn't for him, you know, just supporting me and just guiding me and say, right, do you know what, you can do this. There were certain days and, you know, I'd be craving like burgers. I don't really crave, but I'd yeah, be craving yeah, burgers yeah, all yeah. the time. Standard, bro. I'd be craving burgers all the time, more more so than I've ever done in my entire life. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but did yeah. You, did you fall, did you relapse in it in any, any, any Good times? Question. Good question. So I, I didn't relapse during it, yeah. but I relapsed after competing. Right. Um, I remember, so what I did was, my dad had never been to London. Right. You've been to Heathrow Airport, but that doesn't count. Yeah. Not, he, hadn't, he hadn't actually been to London. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I took my dad, I took my brother, uh, I took my family, and um, went down to London. We competed. We stayed. We stayed in London uh, for three nights. Got there on Friday. Stayed a Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And I remember after I'd competed, I went back to the hotel, brought back to the apartment, and then went back back into London to go eat. Took my dad out. Took my brother out. Took my family out. I couldn't stop eating. Mm. I had no control over what I was eating. Could no control at all. It's binging. Just binging. And it wasn't even healthy binging. I literally, it was the first time in my entire life yeah. where I had no control over my yeah. over what I was eating. I remember on that day, I, I put it into my fitness pal. I still use the app. Put it in my fitness pal. I think I had like 10 and a half, 11,000 calories. I just wow. could not stop eating. I think I must have had like four or five ice creams. I remember going to Camden Market, I literally tried eating everything in sight and I was confused as to why other people weren't yeah. eating. I was confused why my brother wasn't eating. He was like, Saki, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. I literally had no control. And then I remember on the journey home from London back to Huddersfield, um, I just had awful tummy pains. It's probably mm. the best way to describe it. So it wasn't healthy. So yeah, in terms yeah. of relapse, not, not, not a relapse as such during the prep. The prep. But after. Yeah. Um, it wasn't. It That's wasn't, forgivable, it wasn't though, because the competition's over. Do you know it, what I mean? The goal's accomplished in some ways. 
you, you understand what I'm saying though. 100%. Right? Yeah. Uh, but then I think after that, I got invited because I'd placed top three in the Classic Physique, got yeah. invited back to the British finals. And then after that, I started prepping towards the next show. And that was in, so I competed in April. I think the next show was in like October or uh, November time. And then I remember I started prepping towards that. And then I think it was about two months in. And I remember just having a really deep sit down conversation myself and, and my family. And I was like, this isn't worth it. Because yeah. you're losing for the sake of gaining a medal and gaining, mm. I've, I've done it, I've achieved it, I've ticked yeah. it off. Why am I putting myself through this again? And it wasn't worth it. So at that point, I remember I was about two months in. And I think over the space of about two weeks, I gained, I think I competed at about 79, 80 kilos roughly. Yeah. Within about three weeks, I think I went up to like 93, 94 kilos, but I was massive. I got, yeah, I got yeah, yeah. you know, looking back at it now, I was, I was in really good shape then. Um, and then I remember wanting to fill out because the, the judges feedback at the time on the competition, they said, you probably need to add a bit more muscle tissue um, to really fill out your frame and so forth. So I was like, okay, I'll go, I'll go back and I'll ensure that I'll do this moving forward. And then, yeah, I think when I was about two months in, I was like, I'm not doing this. This, right. isn't, this isn't healthy. This is the second competition? Yeah, this was the yeah, second yeah, competition. Yeah. I was like, this isn't healthy. Even though yeah. I'd be invited back and it was it was a great on to go back, you know, to, to compete in the British finals. I was like, I'm not doing this. This isn't worth it. Yeah. And at that point, I pulled back. And I, again, I spoke to my friends and stuff and my family and they said, this isn't this isn't worth this it. Isn't worth it's, it yeah. not, it's not worth it's not yeah. worth putting yourself through that, um, and it's not healthy. And like yeah. I said, you're, you, for what you're sacrificing, it's not worth it. L let's stay on that. You mentioned it's not healthy, so let's give the people an honest take on it. So when you say not healthy, give me some details. What do you yeah. what are you talking about? Low libido. Right, that's okay. a big one. That's a big one. Low yeah. libido. I'll be open and honest about yeah, yeah. low libido. Um, irritability. You just you'll get annoyed at the smallest thing. Yes. Literally the smallest. Yeah, it's not, yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, that was constant all the time. Third one was sleep. My sleep was shot. Mm. I was almost overtired because of the activity that I was doing over the space of the day. So for example, now let's say I was doing an hour cardio in the morning. First thing, as soon as I used to wake up, I'd train for an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And then I have to do another 45 minutes cardio in an evening. Yeah. So essentially I was doing about three hours worth of, three, three and a half hours wow. worth of cardio. Intense, over, man. Uh, sorry, uh, exercise over the space of the day. And then you couple that with, you know, work and stuff and so forth. When you when you combine that as a, over the space of a 12 hour, 14 hour day, it's, it was a lot. Um, and then you obviously be juggling other things, your personal things in your own life. You know, it, it starts taking its toll and yeah, sleep was affected massively. So I would say uh, sleep, relationships, um, low libido. Yeah. Um, That's just from being on a low body fat percentage, right? Low body fat percentage, and also as well with, you, you start having cravings that you've never had before in your life. It's really weird. Yeah. And in terms of from a from a hormone standpoint as well. Yeah, yeah. That also has it when when your when your body fat levels are that low. We're, we're not designed. Our body isn't designed to be at five, six, seven percent body fat. It's not designed to be that. Mm. So when you're pushing it, you're pushing your body to its limits. Yeah. It's it's gonna it's, it's almost gonna have a defense mechanism. So I do not. This isn't healthy for me. This isn't comfortable. So it wants to almost. You want, to, you want to move away from that. So I think for me, it's you want to be in a position whereby you don't want to be pushing yourself to that limit, yeah. period. You know, anywhere between 10, 12% body fat, you know, you've still got your abs showing. You're not absolutely shredded, but you're relatively lean is, for me, is it's almost like the, the sweet spot. Yeah, and we're going to get into um, how to maintain a good physique because you are, martial art in phenomenal shape. Um, exactly. And you're maintaining you know, yeah, yeah. a good level of, you know, balance, would you say, in terms of body fat 100%, percentage. 100%. We'll definitely dive into that a bit yeah. later on. Um, I want to tap into a taboo subject. Okay. PEDs. Yeah. What's the script with PEDs when you're competing, for example? It's a, it's a good question. Really yeah. good question. And I'll be open and honest about it. I think the issue with PEDs is unless you're a competitive bodybuilder and you're the top of your game. Yeah. If you're not, you should not be taking PEDs, period. Yeah. I see people at the gym and the the first source of you know, trying to get into shape is jumping on PED straight away. And it's just not needed. I don't understand it. I don't even know where it stems from. And I see it now and it, people are taking PEDs from a younger and younger age and yes. it's just not healthy. I don't think people understand the side effects of PEDs and it's just not necessary. I think there's so much that can be achieved from living a healthy lifestyle, from proper nutrition, proper exercise, you know, good form, Supplement, decent supplementation, natural supplementation, 
when you couple all them things together, good digestion as well, that's really crucial. When you couple all, the, all them things together, people aren't maximizing that, they're jumping the gun too early. Mm. And I think that's my biggest concern with it. If you're a competitive bodybuilder and you're the top of your game and you need to level up and that's the only way you can level up is by taking PEDs. I've got no issues with that. I've got no issues with people taking PEDs. Yeah. My issue with when people start taking PEDs is when they've not, they've not maximized them initial three, four, five, six things and they'll jump on them straight away. So it's counterproductive. It's not needed. I just so just it. to be clear, your position is stay away from, stay the hell away from PEDs unless you're competing. Yes, absolutely. Unless you're competing and you're competing at a good level, then yeah, yeah. 100% by all means. If you need to take it and everybody, if, if just ensure it's a level level playing field. You can't compete against somebody who's taking PEDs and you're not taking PEDs yourself. If everybody's taking PEDs, you're unfortunately going to have to take them. Yeah, and yeah. let's be honest, they're prevalent in most sports. Yeah. It's a bit of a taboo, whether it's in boxing, whether it's in UFC, whether it's in bodybuilding. Yeah, yeah. PEDs are common. It's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's just some sports can hide them better than others. With yeah. bodybuilding, for example, it, it's pretty blatant. It's you can't blatant. look yeah, yeah, yeah. like Ronnie Coleman yeah. by not taking PEDs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might be the most genetically gifted freak on planet Earth, but you still can't look that way. You know, there's... However, I think people underestimate what you can actually achieve without taking PEDs. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You mentioned something interesting there. You said that you don't know where it comes from. You know, the desire to take PEDs. I think I think social media has brought about a pressure to look a certain way, and because 100%. of that, we're seeing the rise of younger and younger guys taking it. Right? Yeah. It's, it's probably it's social media in it. But you mentioned something off camera that half of these guys you're looking up to on social media are on PEDs, they're not natural. 100%, and you know, you know what's funny is that I'd probably say most of the coaches and influencers that are within within this remit, Yeah. let's be honest, they're probably on PEDs. Yeah, There's yeah. Probably a bit, there might be a few and far between that, not, but they probably are on PEDs based on obviously their physique and so forth. And generally you can tell who's on PEDs and who's not. Yeah. You know, you've been training for a long time. If somebody's been training for, Six months, it's difficult to gauge who's in PDs and who's not. But if you've been in the industry for 14, 15 years, it's quite a considerable period of time. You can understand quite quickly just by looking at somebody. Yeah. You wouldn't ever judge and you wouldn't ever say, oh, you're, what you're doing is wrong. Ultimately, that's their body. They they choose what they want to put inside their body. That's fine. Some people want to get vaccinated. That's fine. Some people want to get stick themselves with a, with a testosterone. That's fine as well. Mm. As long as they understand the side effects of what they're doing and understand how they need to take it. And I've got no issues with that. 100%, man. Um we, we, we touched upon the you know the negative impacts of being on a low percentage of body fat, hormonal yeah, yeah. issues, stuff like that. What are some of the negative aspects, if anything additional, regarding taking PEDs that people should be aware of? 100%. There's so many obvious ones straight away. Yeah. So gynecomastia is an obvious one. It's right. an absolute given. You know, you yeah, yeah. when people are unable to control the estrogen and the testosterone, you know, unfortunately, you'll see a lot of yeah. Guys, I've seen guys at the gym, guys that have had surgery and so forth, mm. both locally and, uh, and further afield as well, that have had gyno. And generally they'll have to, the only procedure for it is, especially if it's if it's been a, a considerable period of time, the only way out of that is by having surgery. Having surgery, yeah. I've um, yeah. seen people go to Turkey and even within the UK, they're having to get surgery done for it. Yeah. And again, it scars, you, you want to avoid that at all costs. So again, that's just not understanding how you need to take PD, so that's the first point. Right. Other side effects, um, you know, poor skin, you know, they'll get acne, yeah. shoulders, neck, face or whatever. That's another one. So another one people mention is you know, roid rage. Now, yeah. roid, ra yeah. roid rage is a funny one because if you're a, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but if you're a dick to begin with, mm. yeah, of course, and you, you take want. steroids, yeah. you're just gonna become a bigger dick. Yeah. If you're not a twat, most likely, even if you were to take steroids, you're probably not going to be a twat later on the line. All it does is essentially amplify whatever you're feeling to begin with. Right, right, right. So it doesn't necessarily turn or change your personality as such. Yeah. All it does is just amplifies whatever you were. I've seen some of the calmest guys I've ever met. They'll take steroids for majority of the, you know, pretty much all year round. Some of the calmest, some of the nicest guys you ever meet. And they stay that way. They stay that way. There's yeah. no roid rage. Right, right. Because they weren't idiots to begin with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got nothing to prove. Right, right. That's whereas, interesting that. Yeah, yeah whereas yeah, a lot yeah. of people now, you'll see them and they're like, oh, I'm roid rage. I'm like, to be fair, the steroids that you're probably taking, they're probably not even steroids anyway. Yeah. Somebody's probably just made that in his bathtub. It could be, there could be all sorts in there. It could be him yeah. and salt. 100%. Also, we're seeing the recent deaths of like Joe Aesthetics as well. Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's difficult to comment on that. And ultimately, you know, yeah. a, loss, a loss of life, you know, it's, you can never pinpoint you is it caused yeah. by X or Y or Z. However, what you can say is definitively is that taking steroids excessively over a prolonged period of time is going to reduce the lifespan. Mm. And there's not really any way around that. You see people where 
you know, they, they'll have this, they'll suffer from body dysmorphia. They, you know, they might they, they might have suicidal thoughts. You know, they might, you know, for example, from a from a heart expansion standpoint, you know, they might, you know, because ultimately mm. your, your heart's an organ, and when you're taking steroids, your heart naturally increases in size as well. Oh, is that what happens? Yeah. So ultimately, yeah. so we have a look at people that go into cardiac arrest and they have heart attacks. That's generally the reason. That's generally the reason why. Yeah. Um, so if you're taking steroids, then yeah, it is naturally going to have an impact in terms from a longevity standpoint anyway. Right. So is it worth it? Probably not. Mm. Like I said, if you're a competitive bodybuilder and that's your only way that you're earning yeah, yeah. money, then yeah, no issues with that. If you're not, leave it. Yeah, and Joe Aesthetic was a shock when he died, man, because on the outside, we mentioned before, he looks like the perfect specimen, man, do you know what I mean? And he was a charismatic guy, do you know what I mean? Fantastic a shock guy. To the Fantastic guy. guy. I've learned so much from him, Fantastic man. Fantastic guy. Amazing, I mean? amazing physique as well. Amazing physique, amazing man. Very physique. rare and um, just a bubbly, genuine guy giving value, yeah. man, do you know what yeah. I mean? Um, but as you mentioned, we can't pinpoint it there, but yeah. there's what, definitely... What I, would, what I would say on that point, though, is yeah. irrespective of what social media tells you, irrespective yeah. of what bodybuilders will tell you, yeah. bodybuilders aren't healthy yeah and i'm not saying some fat guy at mcdonald's is particularly healthy either he's not that's an extreme yeah but bodybuilders as a whole generally yeah. aren't healthy if they were to have a look at the internal health markers you know and so forth generally bodybuilders aren't healthy irrespective of what people say and you recommend people to get their blood works done regardless if you're competing or not just to check your 100%. check if you're healthy man. yeah 100 you, know I mean? you, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a car yeah not get it MOT'd on a yeah, yearly yeah. basis. Good why point. would you not? Why would you not do, do that with your body? It's bananas. Yeah. You, that's that's how do you, you? Somebody can look healthy by just purely on visual appearance. What's what's underneath that is is you know it's open to, open to interpretation in terms of what what do the internal health markers look like? Are they is their digestion on point? You know where 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 are all the where's the, where's their cholesterol? You know where's the blood sugar levels and so forth. If you're not if you don't understand any of them, yeah, then to me that's not healthy. Yeah, hundred percent, man. You know, touching, putting the PEDs aside now. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about testosterone, right? Yeah. Because um, I've seen a study that concluded men's testosterone level since the eighties has dropped significantly in comparison with men in modern days. Yeah. It's difficult to pinpoint again. Food. But what would you food. say is food? You say it's food. Literally food. Yeah. Food and a lack of lack of movement. Simple, two things. Wow. People are eating far more processed rubbish now than they've ever done ever. Right. That's the first point. Yeah. I know simply put, but that's essentially it. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, people are moving far less now than they've ever done. People are working from home. You know, certain, you'll see certain people where Monday to Friday, they'll be literally be sat behind a laptop from nine till five, turn the laptop off, Netflix comes on from seven till 10, and they go to bed mm. and repeat and repeat. Mm. And the week's soon gone by. Saturday, Sunday, yeah. even when it comes to shopping, going to supermarkets, everything's online. If you're not moving, our bodies aren't designed to sit and do nothing. Yeah. Does it make any sense? So yeah, in terms of testosterone levels dipping, then yeah, we're consuming far more rubbish than we've ever done and we're moving far less than we've ever done. So put that as a combination together, testosterone levels are going to be at the lowest they've ever been, yeah. And it's only, gonna, it's only going to continue to go that way. Yeah, yeah, scary man. Scary. Yeah, so, that, so that's uh, I know that's a, probably a very simply simple no, way no, of putting good. it, but yeah. that's but that's the reality is that we're just not moving in, so, enough so, and eating too much. So basically, to maintain the maintain healthy testosterone levels, just do the opposite basically, move more. Yes. So yeah, I think absolute basic fundamentals in terms of maintaining your testosterone. But you have to remember, with testosterone naturally after the age of 21, 22, your testosterone levels naturally start to dip anyway. Yeah. Whether you're healthy or whether you're not, that's just how that's just how we're designed. How do you maintain the healthiest testosterone levels as possible is by ensuring that you're exercising two or three times a week. Yeah. You're having a well-balanced diet. You're getting plenty of, you know, you're walking, you're getting plenty of fresh air. If you're able to do just them, and, and the fourth one is probably the most important, I'd say alongside that, yeah. is getting optimum sleep. People are getting good quality sleep in. You know, sleep is your best friend, when, whether you're looking to add muscle, whether you're looking to lose body fat, whether you're looking to maintain... Um, you know, just your general well-being. Sleep is probably one of the most key fundamentals for that. Yeah, I was going to ask you actually, just touching upon that, what are some of the immediate results one can expect by starting the process of exercising, right? But we just pretty much touched upon it there, right? <laughs> yeah, you're going to be more healthier, have more energy, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Um, and I think I think the benefits that things like exercises and eating well and you know, you have a look at a lot of successful people around the world. Yeah. You know, whether you're reading through a book, whether you're watching podcasts and so forth. Yeah. A lot of the successful people in the world all exercise. Yeah. Now, some of these guys are the, some of the busiest guys on the planet. Now, if these guys can exercise and they're doing 80, 90 hours a week, 
then I'm pretty sure you can exercise if you're working seven hours a day. Wow. You can exercise as well. Let, let's, let's stay on that. I've got a quote for you from Andrew Tate. He said, accept the reality that your physicality and mentality as a man are linked and you cannot be happy and strong in your mind if you are weak in your body. Yes. You need to have a strong body to have a strong mind. 100%. Wow. How true is that? But they're both interlinked. Yes. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. Now, somebody who, somebody who has a strong body, for example, some of the things that achieving a strong body teaches you is resilience, patience. Yeah. Not having instant grat gratification. Now, when you couple all these factors, these are things that, you know, for example, even when it comes to training and having a strong body, you know, having a strong mind, all of these things are interlinked, not necessarily just from a training standpoint, but mm -hmm. in terms of productivity at work, your relationships with your family, relationships with your friends, all of these things are intertwined. And that's why I think, you know, even in terms of training and exercise, what you learn through training exercise is just a small percentage of it, 20% of it. What that teaches you in, in how you conduct the rest of your life, your your work, your your relationships, everything that you do yeah. is massive. I'll give you an example now. You know, people want, we live in a we live in a time where people want instant results. Everything is instant. You know, you want something off Amazon, you literally go on your phone, order it off Amazon, straight away it arrives the next day. Fantastic. Yeah. People yeah. think the health is exactly the same. It's not, it's not, it really isn't. You know, for example, now, sometimes people will come up to me and say, oh, Sakib, can you help me go lose five stone? I'm like, yeah, okay, no, I can help you lose five stone. No, no yeah. issues at all. However, it might take you X period of time. It's just people don't understand how to manage their own expectations with it. You yeah. know, people, we live in a time where everything is instant. I want something. I want it right now. I don't yeah. want to wait for it. Having a strong body teaches you, you have to wait for things. You have to be patient. Yeah. And that teaches you to have a strong mind as well. So that resilience element is so, so important. A hundred percent. Even the discipline of something seemingly small, like going the extra rep in the gym, pushing yourself, translate to like having extra grit in real life when things get yeah. tough, when yeah. things get challenging. Yeah. You go the extra mile, you don't give up. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And hundred percent. And yeah. I think even, for example, now I'll tell you some of the things that the, what training has taught me is, yeah. even when it comes to, I can't believe, even when it comes to time, for example, now, yeah, yeah. if I've said a time to somebody, yeah, I'm going to stick to that time regardless, even if I have to like, eat, or if I'm not going to be able to stick to that time, I'll, at least, I'll, I'll you'll update someone. So having time management is absolutely crucial. When people say they don't have time, mm -hmm. everyone has time. Mm -hmm. Everyone has 24 hours in the day. You can make time. Yeah. If it's important to you, you'll make time for it. If it's not important to you, you ain't going to make time for it. You could have all the hours in the day. Yeah. Like for example, now I, I, I refer back to my own, personal standpoint you know start this year i wasn't praying okay this is slightly off topic but i wasn't no, praying fine. yeah Beautiful. um and i realized that it wasn't a time issue it wasn't a time issue my my time and my day hasn't drastically changed from the start of this year up until now mm. everything was pretty much exactly the same i have the same hours we all have the same hour we all have 24 hours in the day it's just if it's important to you, you'll make time for it. Yeah. Nothing else. You, it's, right now, and it has been, it's, it's been important for me, and it is, is important for me, I will make time for something that's 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 important for me. And Salah is obviously one so of the So you revolve important. your life around Salah now, instead of your Salah around your life? I was going to say, I'm probably not quite at that level. Inshallah, yeah. I will be. Inshallah. Uh, I did, I went to, uh, I went Umrah in uh, February this year with my family. Amazing, man. And... Uh, yeah, that was a that was something that wasn't particularly planned. I don't I don't I don't plan a lot of things. Everything's usually last spontaneous. minute. Spontaneous. Yeah, it's quite spontaneous, quite last minute. And you know, just relating back to my own um, my own self, I felt like everything that I ever wanted in my in, in my life, and that I you know I worked towards. I you know everything that I ever wanted, I worked towards. And if I really wanted it, I would make time for it, and I would get it. Yeah, yeah. And I felt like the things that I'd asked for 10 years ago, Alhamdulillah, I managed to get them. Yeah. But there was still something missing. And after, yeah. after, after going to Umrah with my family, I, I felt like that was the, that was a jigsaw. Final, final piece of the jigsaw. Yeah. Just going back to the, the whole mindset thing as well. Uh, we talked about obviously how, you know, uh, how the mind and the body are connected, right? You mentioned that that's 100%, interconnected. Yeah. hundred um, percent. And you mentioned something interesting as well, where successful people all kind of take care of the health. All train. So, all, all work out, all eat well. Yeah, I, I, I actually agree with you. I think there's a correlation between the healthy you are, the more money you're going to make. Do you know what's funny? You mentioned that. I've actually got a client based in Scotland. Yeah. Um, he actually finished his 12-week uh, transformation last week. Yeah. So this guy's, funny enough, he's got the same name myself. Uh, apologies yeah. uh, uh, if, <laughs> if, I've, uh, if, I've, if I've baited him out here. But 
he's a fantastic a fantastic example of somebody who is a go getter. So within the last twelve weeks, he be, just became a father. Mm, mashallah. He has a conventional nine to five job as an investment banker. He yeah. runs his own mortgage company. Yeah. He just acquired a nursery. He's runs his own property portfolio. Wow. And he still, over that time period, over the last 12 weeks, he still managed to get in the best shape of his life. Mm. So if this guy can do it, and I, for me now, he is, he's not successful because of the things that he owns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's successful because he's managed to do all of that and get in the best shape of his life and be a father. Yeah, yeah, That yeah. To me, that is, yeah, yeah. that is the pinnacle of, not yeah. necessarily the pinnacle of success, but that is, that is successful to me. 100%. And, and I think the other thing as well is, you, you mentioned the word success. I think everybody has a different definition of success. Mm. If you were to ask me that same question, what does success look, look like to you 10 years ago? It'd be very different to what, it, what, what I think it looks like now. I see a lot of people that look successful on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're not. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah, I've seen yeah. people that have got the most fanciest of cars. And when, when, I, when I go through my consultation with them, and in terms of what they're struggling with, they might be strugg struggling with mental health, they might be struggling with depression, they might be struggling with anxiety. To me, that's not successful. Yeah. Just touching upon you, you said a few things there that I'm just going to go off now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny, like, because we're both married men, yeah? And my circle of friends are all married as well. Yeah, yeah. But I still find time to go to the gym. Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, I mentioned, like, the more healthier you are, potentially you're going to make more money. I'll give you a small example. Like, for me, after the nine to five job, right, people don't know. I got a nine to five job. <laughs> there you go. Um, I come home and I go to the gym. That's my reset, right? When I come out of the gym, don't get me wrong, when I go to the gym, I'm absolutely exhausted. I'm shattered. I can't be arsed, bro. Yeah, yeah. Right. But when I get there, I've done my workout, I come out, I have my protein shake, I'm hit my reset button. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready to go again. Done my dad duties, done my responsibility at home, nine till 12, I'm working on the podcast. Yeah. Brilliant. I've complicated my life by adding the podcast, but hey, do you know what I'm trying to say? Phenomenal. That weather. gym it's phenomenal. makes me go the extra mile. Do you know what I'm trying to say? 100%. And my circle of friends, right, the they're, they're the opposite, they like kind of let themselves go a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And to me, that doesn't make sense, bro, because that's the time you're meant to be giving your wife, your children, your family, your community the best version of yourself. 100%. The best energy. 100%. Why are you saying, oh, married life has changed me? Do you know what I mean? We hear that in our community, right? I I, I hear it all the time. Yeah, and again, yeah, a lot yeah. of a lot of clients I work with yeah. are in that same predicament themselves. Yeah. They feel like marriage is almost like the time to switch off. They, they don't need to look you know, look their best for their husband or for their wife. Exactly. And that just blows my mind. Why would you not want to look the best for your husband or for your wife? You'd rather look your best when you're single. Why? That doesn't yeah. make any sense. And give your best to your children, yeah, your children. community, your neighbours, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, and even when it comes to being a parent now, when, when you're, if you're, if you're a child yourself and if you see your parent constantly sat in front of the television, I'll yeah. give you an example here. Yeah. Sat in front of the television all the time, constantly on the phone all the time. How are you leading by example in your home? Mm. You are not leading by example in your home. Mm. If you teach a child to be fit, teach them to be healthy and take part in what, so for example, now I've got, just touching on it in terms of my own, I've got a, got a lady who I work with in Birmingham, she's an online client. Now, when I was, I remember going through the consultation with her and she was struggling with time. Yeah, I'm just giving an example. Yeah, yeah. She was struggling with time. Now, we went through the consultation, we understood that, okay, she's got a young son, he loves playing football. Loves playing football. She's yeah. got no interest in football at all. Yeah, yeah. No interest in football at yeah. all. Now, for me, that was a perfect opportunity to find a solution. The solution was for her to find something that her son also enjoys. You know, son enjoys playing football. So it was putting two and two together. It's just simple maths. Once I found the solution, she and now she started taking part in playing football with her son. It's good quality time spent. Yes. They both get healthy. Yeah. Both get fit. They build a better relationship. For me, that's a win-win. 100%. Why would you not do that? Exactly. So, so looking back at it now, I remember, I remember speaking about it at the time. For me, that was amazing because it was like, we've managed to, you know, we've managed to kill two birds with one stone there. We've alleviated the time issue. We've also improved their, for, for example, from a relationship standpoint, but also ensured that she's also been able to get into shape. Now, it's just understanding that we as, if you're, whether you're a parent, whether, whoever you might be, but as parents in particular, you need to ensure that Whatever sport or whatever whatever your child is into, and if you're not particularly playing many sports yourself, just take part in what they're doing. Yeah. Use that as your source of activity. Just take it's gonna improve your relationship with your child and also it's gonna help you get into shape. Yeah, exactly. Why win, would you win. not do that? Win win, man. Win win. Why would you not do yeah. that? So I think in terms of yeah, being the best version of yourself, I think as as whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, you want to be the best role model for your child. Yeah. And if you're 
you know, my, my friends, but if you're overweight and you're constantly feeling tired and it's low on confidence, low on self-esteem, yeah. you're not presenting the best version of yourself to either yourself or to your child. And that isn't, that isn't healthy either. Yeah. When people say, I'm, you know, I don't have the time or when, when, when they say, oh, I don't have the energy to go to the gym. Yeah. I've been a coach for the last seven years. I've trained for the last 14, 15 years. There's so many days in the week. I'll give you an example. There's probably like two or three days in the week, every single week, where I just think I cannot be bothered going to the gym. Same. I do not want to go to the gym. But I know once I go to the gym and I've come back, I'm going to feel amazing. Yeah, yeah. And there's no feeling like it. We never regret going to the gym. I've never heard one person has ever said that they regret going to the gym. Exactly. But I've heard people regretting saying that they wish they'd gone to the gym. Bro, I've not been to the gym one week, right? I felt worse. I'm like, I can't, like like I said, I did a podcast at nine till 12 at night. Yeah, right? yeah. I can't do it. I'm yeah. too tired. I'm shattered. Yeah. When I do go to the gym, it's like the opposite. It's weird, isn't it? Like get your ass in the gym, man. Like it's yeah. going to change your life. It's going to give you more energy. Yeah. It's, a, I don't even think, it's not even necessarily about getting yourself into the gym. You know, yeah. there's, there's so many ways to work out. That's yeah. true. There's That's so true. many ways to work yeah. out. Yeah. You know, for example, I have a lot of um, female clients who don't want to go to the gym. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we'll, we'll base, base a program that works for them. You know, yeah. from home, or there it's might be some um, young gentleman that say, right, you know, I don't feel confident, or they they'll suffer from gym anxiety. You know, where they don't want to actually enter a gym, they feel like they it's quite an intimidating. For some people, it might be quite an intimidating environment. I remember when I first entered the gym myself, I was like really young when I first first entered the gym. Yeah. I remember I was supposed to be at a mosque, you know, yeah. madrasa when I was a kid. I skipped, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I skipped madrasa, skipped and I went to uh, the local shop. I bought an nourishment can. I don't remember the nourishment yeah, cans yeah, back yeah, in the yeah, day. Yeah, of course, the blue can. Yeah, so there yeah. was a blue, there was a blue one. There was a strawberry one. I remember. It's full of sugar now. That's awful. awful. Looking back, back at it, back <laughs> it was literally <laughs> just like sugar, sugar and milk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was awful. I remember <laughs> I used to drink it, and I just felt like, oh, you know, this is going to give me the energy <laughs> to go to the gym because it looked like a really strong protein energy drink yeah, so i was yeah. like okay we obviously didn't know very much i remember going to the gym at the time and looking around i was like wow like these guys are so big it's, it's quite an intimidating environment it is, it is. and i think i see people even as they get older do genuinely suffer from gym anxiety yeah and it's okay yeah yeah it's okay but i think once you're able to overcome that by just by going getting yourself into the gym and realizing that no one cares mm. no one cares everyone's been in that boat themselves everyone's been in that situation i've been in that situation myself Mm. where it's quite intimidating it's quite you know overwhelming but once you step foot in there you'll quite quickly realize this is for anyone that, that suffers from gym anxiety by the way yeah. you'll quite quickly realize that once you're there no one, no one cares. cares no one's looking at you no one's looking at you. you just go do your thing yeah you leave second day do exactly the same thing no one cares and then before you know it you, you build a habit yeah, yeah. It's, it's now bec now it's become ingrained and it's part yeah. of your routine yeah. the difficulty that people have is that you know they'll do it once and they won't do it again. Yeah. Or they'll do it for a week and they won't do it again. Yeah. It's just that yo-yo effect. You want to avoid that at all costs. Just start small and then just build up. Touching upon that, Terry Crews. Yeah. You know who Terry Crews is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny, man. He gave a good advice, to be fair. He said, um, treat the gym like a spa. So, for example, on your first day, just show up. Yeah, yeah. Don't lift no weights. Just walk around, sip some water, have a look around, go home. Yeah. Next day, show up again. Okay, you've seen a dumbbell, pick you up, lift one rep, go home. Okay. Next day, basically, you get the idea. Yeah, yeah. Keep showing up, and if, in a year's in, in a year's time, you've absolutely mastered the habit, and then you're, you're incorporating routines in now. Do you know what I'm trying to say, boys? As you mentioned, it starts with one small step to show up. Yeah, I think that, I think the biggest mistake people make is that they will try doing too many things in one given moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it all the time. I'll give you an example yeah. now. People will have never worked out in their entire life. Mm -hmm. They'll go to the gym for the first week, five times in the week. Yeah. Now, if you've never trained in your life and you've now all of a sudden started training five times a week. Yeah. You're going to be like, what on earth is this? It's not sustainable. It's going to be like a train hit you, man. Yeah, it's like, Jesus, like, you're going to be wrecked. You're going to be suffering yeah, from yeah. doms. You're going to be tired. You're going to yeah. be shouting. Like, oh, I don't want to do that again. Yeah, yeah. Start small. And exactly what Terry Crews, probably not quite to that extent, yeah, yeah. but um, <laughs> you're going to probably start off with like, yeah, start off with maybe one or two workouts over the space of the week, yeah. whether that's from home or whether that's at the gym. Like I said, gym's just a for, just a place to exercise. It's not the only place to exercise. You can exercise at the park. You can exercise in the garden. Yeah. You can exercise from home. You can you can uh, go swimming. There's so many ways to go hiking. There's so many ways to exercise. The gym's just one form of that. Yeah, that's a um, nice segue into the common mistakes then. So the num number one common mistake is people go too hard too soon, innit? 100%. Yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll go too hard too soon and also they'll give up on too many things. So for example, now, let's say for the last 10 years, you've been having the same breakfast, the same lunch, the same dinner. 
Now, if somebody came up to you and said, right, do you know, Habib, you need to now ditch that, you need to ditch that, and you need to ditch, you need, you, you need to ditch everything that you're doing, it's not yeah. going to work. Yeah. You're going to be like, sat this. Yeah. And the other, the, other, the other issue that people have is they'll, they'll get put onto a, a nutrition plan and they'll deem that as a diet. A diet, to be fair, a diet itself has negative connotations with that word. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it, it sounds like it's restrictive, it sounds like it's short term, it sounds like it's temporary. Mm. You shouldn't think like that. This isn't, this is, you should think of it as a, a genuine lifestyle change that you want to make long term. Mm. When, when I want people to get into shape, for example, I don't want them to just quickly get into shape over the space of eight weeks. I want them to make changes that are self-sustainable for the, for the, for the remainder of the time. Right. So these, these habits become ingrained. Yeah. Now, for example, now if you said to me, Sakib, do you know what? This is what I'm eating on a daily basis. I don't exercise. Now, for me to say to you, go out, exercise five times a week, you know, stop having all these foods that you've, you've had isn't going to be sustainable it's, you're, you're going to last for a week and then you're going to disappear yeah that is just a waste of everybody's time mm. i'd rather you say right you know what i'd be like you can commit to two workouts a week is that how many commit to? yeah i can commit to that no problem okay perfect you want to do it from home or you doing it from the gym i want to do it from home i don't feel that comfortable at the gym okay let's start off from home just start off small just making small increments yeah. you can't go from zero to 100 overnight yeah, yeah, yeah. but you can go from zero to 20 20 to 40 yeah. 40 to 80 and then all of a sudden within space of three months 12 months you're up to 100 and it's completely fine. Some people just take longer to get into that 100 than others. And that's that, fine that, as well. That's one thing I like about your program, Strictly Body Gains, because you incorporate these things we mentioned, yeah, you take yeah. into consideration their busy lifestyle and you have a saying, you don't, you can get into shape without sacrificing your social life. Yeah, right? 100%. For example, you have Cocoa Pops every day. <laughs> How is that even possible? Uh, yeah. I'll be honest here, I've, I've had Cocoa Pops for a long, I still love Cocoa Pops. Yeah. I think the only issue now is I think they've, on the recent boxes, they've got the 30% reduced sugar ones. Right, um, right. They don't quite hit the spot as yeah, the yeah. original ones, but then to be fair, the uh, macros worked out, work out to be slightly better. But yeah, yeah. I love Coke Pops. Who doesn't love Coke Pops? I don't know, well, I don't know anyone in my circle that doesn't like Coke Pops, but yeah, uh, yeah still Coke Pops, pretty much every single workout day, I'll have Coke Pops without fail. Either Coke Pops or might be really adventurous and have ice krispies. With the fitness industry, right? There's so much information out there, bro. So like, much. Do I pick for a, for a new guy? Do <laughs> so I pick much information. I, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. For the new guy is, do I pick if you if if it your macros? Do I pick keto? Do I pick carnivore? Like, where do we go? And you know, thank God there's people like you that yeah, can yeah. you know alleviate that thinking, and you can do the thinking for them. Yeah. Should I say? Yeah. yeah. Um, but like, what's what's the script, man? Like, is it calories in versus calories out? Where do we start? It it, it is to an extent, but in terms of People ask me the question, what's the best diet, Saki? What's the best diet? Yeah, yeah. There isn't a best diet. The best diet is the one that you can actually stick to. Now, for you, that might be very different to, to my nutrition plan or diet. Yeah, yeah. And that's completely fine. Yeah. What's going to work for you might not necessarily work for me and vice versa. And I think because there's so much information out there, yeah. and it genuinely baffles me. If I, was, if I was starting out my fitness journey now and I was to go online and go on Instagram, it's not, it's just so much information. And it's not even so much information. It's, a lot of it is conflicting information. Somebody, I remember all, like even now up until this day, I'll get some, sometimes people, clients will message me saying, oh, so-and-so's saying this, what are your thoughts on this? And half of it is just clickbait. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, half yeah. of it is absolute waffle. Literally, <laughs> absolutely, it's, it's absolute waffle. I think people complicate the process so much. They'll be like, oh, my way is the best way. And then another guy will say, my way is the best way. If people are saying that, they're idiots. Because the reality is, there is a way that'll work for every single person, but it's not always the same way. And, and, that, and that's the reality. And I think too much information sometimes isn't a good thing. I remember when I was going through that journey myself, you know, 14, 15 years ago, there wasn't that much information out there. So you were having to almost kind of wing it and just try it. And obviously we didn't have the mentors and the coaches. I remember when I first started out, you know, six and a half, seven years ago, online coaches weren't even a thing. Yeah, I remember yeah, when I was yeah, trying to explain yeah. to people what it is that I did, they were like, but are you a PT? I'm like, no, I'm not a PT. <laughs> yeah, they were yeah. like, so what are you then? What, what? They could not grasp that idea. Yeah, so yeah. I suppose from that perspective, in terms of there's more people doing it now, which I suppose probably saturates the market a little bit, but for me, it makes it easier to explain to people what it is that I actually do. So in terms of from an information standpoint, I'll, I'll be honest with you, a lot of people just regurgitate the same information over and over again. Yeah. And those word it slightly differently, but the reality is the message is the same. So in terms of what's best, so I've seen, I see people do keto, I see people do intermittent fasting, I see people on smoothie diets. Yeah. All sorts of weird and wonderful diets, Slimming World and the rest of it. I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't recommend any single one of them. Mm, interesting. However, I would recommend an approach that is going to fit into your lifestyle. And I think without actually understanding somebody yeah. and understanding their routine, their food habits, their allergies and so forth, 
it is impossible for me to say what the best nutrition plan is for you because it's it, it, I'd be guessing and I'd be lying. So, yeah, so I'm assuming that you have a consultation with the guys. Yeah, yeah. so from a, from yeah. a consultation standpoint, and this is really crucial as well, and I think people sometimes don't understand the process from a consultation. If you're from a consultation, you want to extract as much information out of the individual as possible. Yeah. The more information that they provide, the more tailored, the more bespoke you can advise and tweak a particular program to that particular individual. But... If somebody doesn't provide you information, you're kind of second guessing and it's, that's not really the best way. So yeah, I yeah. think from a consultation standpoint, this is why, you know, cookie, cook, cookie cutter diets don't work. Like I could send out a diet to you, Joe Blogs, Dave, Andrew, Shahid. It's not going to work for all of you. It might yeah. work for one of you. And that's, that's, not a, that's not a realistic approach. It's not a healthy approach because... Like I said, it's just it's just a waste of everybody's time to be honest. So just to summarize, your thoughts on the fitness industry is garbage at the moment. A lot of misinformation out there. Too many online coaches. Yeah, too many online coaches. Too many, uh, too much garbage. And also as well, I think people are just will try and put other people down on yeah. that premise as well. And you know, rather than you know saying, "Oh, my way is the best way," and your way is not that great, why don't why don't they actually come together and say, "Right, do you know what?" what I'm doing is okay and what you're doing is also okay. Uh, and it's fine. You know, I think especially within within the South Asian community now, Yeah. I don't, again, like so when I first started, there was very, I think it was probably like two or three other coaches that were doing a similar, yeah, yeah. similar thing. And even I remember we were doing the check-ins and stuff. People just didn't understand. Like, okay, well, do I have to check in? What does that, what does that actually entail? What mm -hmm. does it look like? And I remember when I first started, I had to go out and chase clients to say, you need to check in on Sunday morning or you need to check on Monday morning. Yeah. And I was like, this is, why, why should I be chasing you? Yeah, yeah. You you know you should be if you if you're if you're using somebody you should respect their time you should respect their advice you should, you know it, it needs to be a two way it needs to be a two way thing it can't just be a one way thing otherwise I might as well be a nagging yeah one. yeah no that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you actually to be honest because you're an online coach it's a business at, at the end of the day right yeah 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 and that's the new way of making money to be fair it's being yeah, yeah. a synthesizer which basically means you have your knowledge yeah, and yeah. you you're able to apply it, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah you teach it so but what are some of the most frustrating things that you see from clients man that you just can't be asked with man you mentioned one there which is like they don't respect your time yeah, yeah I think I think when you've when you've set out what you want them to do and over the space of the week you know there'll be I think the biggest thing is just being honest. Right. If they're honest, yeah. I, some, I get asked, what's the perfect client? If somebody's honest with me, I don't care what stage, I don't care if they've never lifted a dumbbell in their life, I don't care if they've you know, never had an avocado in their life, I couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. I just want somebody to be honest. And if, they, if, they, if they've committed to a process, let me lead. Yeah. Let, let, you know, let me lead. And you, as long as you're obviously able to, able to take instructions and we're able to work together as a genuine two-way working relationship, then it's always going to work. Yeah. And when it comes to honesty in particular, if you're not honest with yourself, you're not going to be honest with me. Mm. There'll be a certain instances where, oh, I've done everything that you've said me to do. I've not lost weight. I've not gained muscle. I know for a fact, when I've been on your Instagram story, your yeah. Instagram story tells me yeah. otherwise. <laughs> you have not. You have Slip not. In. Yeah, you've. I've seen some of them donuts. I've yeah. seen some of them, uh, you know, ice creams. Don't yeah, don't yeah. lie to me when it says I've I've done this and I've done this. I know for a fact you haven't, so don't lie. So honesty is probably the honesty the, the biggest one. the biggest thing. Because yeah. if you're honest, I can live with anything else. If yeah. somebody's not done what they've set out, they, they, they said they were going to do, that's fine. But just be honest. You probably have them guys that want quick fixes as well. Yeah, like, oh, I need to get in shape like in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, and I think again, I think it's just managing managing your expectations and managing their expectations. At the end, there's been loads of instances where somebody's come up to me and said, "Sakib, I need to get into shape within." five weeks i've got four stone to lose yeah I'm like mate mm. it has not taken you five weeks to add four stone yeah, yeah it is yeah, not going to yeah. take you five weeks to lose four stone just be yeah. realistic yeah, who's yeah. gonna lose four stone in five weeks yeah. nobody it's not you know it's not realistic so again i think just in terms of managing expectations and sometimes you know you'll speak to somebody you might not necessarily get a good vibe with them you feel like they're not going to be a good fit and yeah. that's okay sometimes it's okay to turn away business but i think when you're first starting out you don't want to turn away business. You're happy to take anyone, but I think the deeper into the process, you go, you'll be in a similar position. Yeah, yeah. You know, with the podcast now, I'm yeah, sure yeah. that once it continues to grow, mm. you're going to be a bit more selective with the clients that you're looking to bring on because you're like, well, hold up, I don't need to bring X on or I don't need to bring Y on. It's not worth my time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I might get, there might be a monetary value in there, but it's not worth my time. It's not worth the headache. So I think the deeper into the process they go and the, and the more the brand builds, you, you can be a bit more selective with the clients that you work with. Yeah. And that resonate with you a bit more. 100%. One question I want to ask from a personal standpoint, yeah, right, yeah. is how true is this, like, have one gram of protein per pound of body weight? Is that yeah. legit or what, 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 what do you... It's, it's a good, 
a figure to aim towards. Right. Yeah, it's a good figure to aim towards. But ultimately, like I said, it depends on what your goals are, what you're looking to achieve. Yeah. But whether you're looking to gain muscle or whether you're look at, looking to lose body fat, generally a pound, sorry, a gram uh, of protein per pound of body weight generally is a good figure to aim towards. Bro, that just seems like a lot to me, man. That's a lot, man. It is and it isn't. Obviously, there's, you know, if you're living quite a, a busy lifestyle, yeah. you know, this is where supplements can be quite advantageous. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like whey, protein, and things like that, where you can incorporate that. Because the, the reality is, if you're working nine to five, yeah. you have not got the time to eat six meals a day. Mm. Why do you want to be eating six meals a day? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to be eating six meals a day. Yeah. In an ideal world, you want to be eating maybe three meals a day, at best four meals a day, but really anywhere between two and four meals is what I would consider personally yeah. as realistic. Now to expect someone to eat six meals a day isn't going to be feasible, especially if you've got nine to five, you've got a young family, you know, you've got a side hustle, whatever it might be, you cannot have six meals a day. It is not, unless you're just spending your whole day eating. Too much time, man. Yeah, and I think the other issue is that people will try and replicate how bodybuilders live. They yeah. will see their, their favorite bodybuilder who they follow on Instagram having six meals a day, and they'll be like, oh, to have that physique, I also need to eat six meals a day. But you've got no desire to compete. Yeah. Why are you trying yeah, to replicate yeah. that guy? Yeah, exactly. Why? So you don't need to. So yeah, just in terms of three meals a day, and if you're eating a decent amount of protein within that time period, that's fine. If not, like, so you can always supplement it with additional uh, whey protein and things like that. There's a period of time where I was feeling tired all the time, and I'm thinking, why is this, man? But then I increased my protein intake yep. and water intake. Yep. Those two Waters. things were a game changer for me, man. Yeah. Like, I, I think that people don't actually emphasize the importance of hydration. Now, hydration doesn't necessarily always come from water. So for example, lack of electrolytes, yeah. Lack of minerals can also cause dehydration as well. People make the assumption that water is the only way that you can get hydrated. Right. That's incorrect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of the times it's water coupled with electrolytes. You know, for example, coconut water is great. Right, you know, right. Coconut water is a really good addition alongside obviously water. And just naturally electrolytes as well, a fantastic addition as well. But in terms of water, generally the other issue that people have is when they're hungry, if they were to have let's say they'd have between three and four liters of water a day. They, they usually recommend for people that are exercising quite regularly, probably probably a little bit more than that. But a lot of the times people aren't drinking enough water. When they're not drinking enough water, bear in mind two thirds of your body's full of water. Yeah, yeah. You wanna be ensuring yeah, yeah. that your, your water consumption's optimal. 100%. And if it's not, then the negative uh, the side effects from the, the the lack of water, the lack of dehydration is is gonna is gonna is gonna play its part later on the line. Whether you're feeling lethargic, you've got brain fog, constantly feeling tired all the time, you know, lack of focus and so forth. So yeah, hydration is generally as a rule of thumb. I know it's a bit personal, but generally as a rule of thumb, if your wee's not clear, mm. you're not drinking enough water. <laughs> if it's if there's color in it, start drinking more water. Right. That's generally a good rule of thumb. So what are some of the challenges that one would go through potentially when going on this journey of becoming healthier or trying to become the best version of themselves? Good question. So I think in terms of, it, it varies from person to person, but I think in terms of, for example, within the South Asian community, yeah, um, some of the challenges that they might face might be different to some of the challenges that people outside the South Asian community might face. And I, and, and I can talk from this first hand, I can also talk from experience working with various people, um, both in the UK and, uh, and elsewhere, is when somebody becomes starts to become healthier, you know, their, their nutrition starts to change for the better, they no longer want to eat four parantas in the morning, they no longer want to eat ghee in an evening, they no longer want to eat three rotis in an evening and so forth. You know, for, for example, some households that might be a little bit overwhelming, a little bit, well, why are you, why are you doing this? You, sh you know, roti is healthy and, you know, Branta are healthy and this is healthy and so forth. But I think sometimes you just have to make people within your own family and your own extended network understand that you're, sometimes when you're taking advice from people that might be diabetic, unfortunately diabetes is prevalent within the South Asian community. Yeah, yeah. And largely, obviously not with the greatest genes either, but largely it's self-inflicted in terms of the nutrition and the diet that we have and have been for the last 50, 60 years. Now, sometimes taking advice, you wouldn't take advice from somebody who, to go around a racetrack as fast as you possibly can from somebody who drives a Nissan Micra. Yeah. And as harsh as it sounds, it's not always the right thing to take advice from somebody who's not particularly healthy themselves, mm. especially if it's self-inflicted as well. Makes sense. Now, I think the difficulty that some people have where they're living with their families and stuff is getting their family to come on board with their health and transformation journey because it'll make their life easier. And then also as a byproduct, it'll actually make their family healthier as well. Yeah, yeah. Now, 
you know, they'll say, oh, you know, you shouldn't be eating this. Oh, you should stop now. You should stop now. You should, you've lost too much weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were all obese to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Why should they stop? Why should, why, why do they, why do they need to, they've gone from being obese to overweight. They've still got a lot, a lot more weight to lose. Yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes as a person, it can be quite demoralizing knowing that people within your family are, you know, throwing negative underhand comments towards you say, oh, you should, you know, you're looking too skinny now. You're looking too big now. You're looking too muscular now. Just ignore it. Yeah. Just ignore it. It's not, A, it's not healthy. It's not needed, but you just have to kind of turn a blind eye to say, all right, it's okay. That's fine. With the hope that they'll hopefully come on with that transformation journey with you. And they'll see that you're now, the way that you're carrying yourself is better. You're healthier. Your skin's glowing. Your hair's amazing. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're in terms of just your general, just the way you carry yourself is far better now. And they, and, and you're almost leading by example yeah. for your siblings, for, for your, for your, for your children, for your parents. So rather than fighting that battle, yeah, yeah. make them come on to that journey with you. And I guarantee you'll make your life so much easier. And some of the best transformations that I've had over the last six and a half, seven years have been people that have had transformed their own health and their yeah. body. Yeah. Their, their wives come on to it as well. Then the sister-in-law, then the brother-in-law, then the parents, then the friend. Honestly, there's been probably about four or five instances where I've one person has started. Yeah. And before you know it, within the end, by the end of that year, the entire family is on the transformation journey because they've seen that this person looks better, feels better, talks differently, is so yeah. much more confident. Yeah. That's something that money can't buy. I've seen people that are unbelievably su successful and, you know, they might have the fanciest of cars, they might have a Lamborghini, they might have a Ferrari and so forth, mm. but they're not confident because they're overweight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter what car you have, no one cares. Once, you, once you're having that conversation and, you don't, and you're not confident in your, in your own self, yeah exercise and living a healthy lifestyle will make you confident so forget about how you look this isn't even about vanity at this stage you want to feel good and look good once you feel and good and look good whether it's through your relationships whether it's at work you're going to become more productive yeah and so forth the, the, the benefits are endless and i just think people will only only people that have been through that journey themselves yeah will see that and once they've been to the end of it that's when they look back at it and be like wow i would never want to go back to how i looked and felt a year ago that's that's a long that's long gone now. Yeah, I want I want to I want to use this as a benchmark and continue to push up from there. Hundred percent in South Asian community, there's going to be a lot of barriers, man. <laughs> Especially with our food in it. You know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? There, there is, but you could. But at the same time, you can still enjoy these foods. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. like for example, I'll, I'll go to my parents' house. You know, generally on a Sunday, for example. You know, my mum will make food, and you know, you can't turn that food down. Yeah, should, they've made it with love. They have made it with so much affection. They've made it so much. You know they've made it to, to, to please yeah, you and so forth. Yeah. And to turn that food down would be rude. So you still eat it. Yeah. But at the same time, you can still enjoy that occasional curry. You can still enjoy, you know, for example, you want that burrata, that's fine. Yeah. But within moderation. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, within moderation. The issue that people have is they don't understand what moderation is. Yeah. We overeat and don't move enough. And like I said before, that combination is just a recipe for disaster. And what you said about well, the confidence thing is so key, man, because just that alone is worth you know, change your life around, man. Um, I had a MMA guy, uh, MMA coach, not yeah. too long ago on a podcast, and he mentioned that um, when you walk into a room and at the very least, you know you can defend yourself, you carry yourself in a certain way. 100%. Do you know what I mean? And that gives 100%. you an empowering confidence. 100%. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and do you know, do you know what's funny is that you'll, you know, over, over, you know, over your life, you'll sit in rooms where, you know, there's people that are deemed very successful. Yeah. But you can tell the ones who are confident who aren't. So people yeah. just brash and those be very loud for the sake of it. But you can tell who is genuinely confident. Yeah. And that's just something money just cannot buy. You cannot could be the rich. You could yeah. be the richest man in that room. Yeah, yeah. But if you're not confident about yourself, yeah, you can have all. You can have literally the fanciest car on planet Earth parked outside. No one gives a crap. It might look okay for a you know yeah. an hour or so. But for example, now you, you know you see somebody who looks in amazing, amazing shape, but he drives a Nissan Micra. I've seen people now. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. I've seen people where I've literally bought a ten pound t-shirt, mm -hmm. literally bought a ten pound t-shirt. But where's that t-shirt from? Mate, it's ten pound from Zara. I've seen people that have bought a six hundred pound t-shirt, an off-white t-shirt. Yeah, amazing t-shirt. Looks terrible. Looks, looks ter awfully yeah, yeah. out of shape. Yeah, 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 yeah. No yeah. one cares where he's bought that t-shirt from because yeah, yeah, it looks yeah. terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I would rather be that guy who's wearing that ten pound t-shirt. Yeah. 
Um, and makes it look like a, a thousand pound t-shirt. hundred percent. Do you know what I mean? hundred percent. And you see people, when, even when it comes to investing in themselves, they will rather invest into that fancy Montclair jacket. They'll rather invest into that fancy LV bag. They'll be, you'll see themselves invest. And when, but when it comes to investing in themselves, yeah. too expensive, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's too expensive? Yeah. According to your Instagram, you yeah. actually <laughs> are very, very well yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not that expensive. Yeah. Don't buy that fancy bag or t-shirt or whatever it might be just invest in yourself and i guarantee you you'll be when you wear them same clothes and you've got a different level of confidence about you yeah you're gonna wear them differently and that is that is confidence and like i said before you know i've seen people wear 10 pound t-shirts i've seen people wear five hundred pound t-shirts and i'd rather be that guy who's wearing a 10 pound t-shirt mm. and pull it off 100 percent, man no question about that brother <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you that you know, but yeah it's uh it, it's just yeah it's just it's one of the things isn't yeah it? Hundred percent, man. That was a nice one. That's gonna be a clip, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> that's no, gonna be no, a clip. No, it's true, though, isn't it? Do you, yeah, do you yeah, realize yeah. like you see it all the time, like, oh, bro, where's that T-shirt from? I'm like, literally, I was like, that's a ten pounds Zara T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. And then you see other people all the time, like, oh, bro, where's? That? It's such a nice T-shirt. I'm like, I wish you were in shape. That T-shirt would look phenomenal. But mm. You're not in shape. And you can just see it rippled. <laughs> that's harsh it is. It's as true, harsh it is. Yeah. You, you don't want a body shame. You don't want a yeah. fat shame. Yeah. You know, because you know, I could quite be easy in that position. You know, if you got uh, illness or whether you've got, you know, whatever it might be, but. Yeah. You know, you wanna you wanna you wanna be able to look good, feel good. Generally. Um join the podcast to a close, brother. Um I did have one question that I stole from Modern Wisdom Podcast. Okay. And that he asked every single yeah, yeah. bodybuilder that he's interviewed, right? And that is you have been training for the X amount of years, yep. enabling you to develop this incredible physique. Yep. You have ten exercises you can do for the rest of your life in order to maintain as good a physique as you can. What are they and why? Ten exercises. That's a brilliant question, isn't it? Um pull ups. Why? Pull-ups. Probably one of the best back building exercises there out there. And, it, and to be fair, you don't really need any equipment. You can literally jump on the back of, on the top of a door. Yeah. Just try and do pull-ups on the, on the top of that. So from a, from an in terms of accessibility standpoint, you can literally do that anywhere, anytime, wherever you want. So for me, pull-ups is a given. Pull-ups. Second one, dips for the exact same reason. You can yeah. build phenomenal triceps and you can build phenomenal chest on the on the back of dips. And again, it can be done anywhere, anytime. You can literally, I, I remember during COVID time, I didn't have anywhere to do dips. I would literally get my hands on the back of a sofa and then I'd put my feet on a table yeah, and I would yeah, do dips yeah. in between. And yeah. that was my only form of dips. Right, right. So again, it's probably a bit of innovation in that as well. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, dips is probably, probably the second one. That second one. So you got uh, your arms there pretty much, right? Yeah, so in terms of the third one, I would probably say inclined chest press. Okay. Um, fantastic, fantastic uh, chest building uh, movement. Why? Dumbbells in particular, I feel like you get a better contraction mm. doing dumbbells as opposed to barbells. There's probably going to be a lot of people that are going to be out there that will be disagreeing with me, but I don't care. Yeah. Um, but yeah, dumbbells in particular, love, love that exercise. And especially once you feel that mind muscle connection, especially in that exercise, for me, ultimately, uh, exercise selection is different for everyone, but that exercise in particular, just I love that exercise. Right. That's three there. Four, I would say squats, uh, yeah. squats purely based on the premise that it's probably one of the most taxing exercises, probably one of the exercises that works more muscle than any other exercise that, that there is. So in terms of bang for your buck. Yeah. It's probably the best, one of the best, if not the best exercise out there. Number five, I'd probably say a leg press. Right. Again, the things with a leg press, it's it's not one that you're probably going to be able to access quite easily. You'll have to be at the gym for it. Yeah. Uh, but again, in terms of pure quad activation and hamstring activation, it's a fantastic exercise. And it's quite versatile as well. So you can do quads, you can do hamstrings, you can do calves. So again, it's a brilliant exercise. Awesome. Uh, Halfway through, man, to maintain the ultimate physique for life. Number with 10 exercises. Number six, I would probably say a mixture of either deadlift or a rack pull, one or the other. What's a rack pull? So essentially, a rack pull is almost exactly the same as a deadlift, yeah. but it's two thirds of the movement. So oh, rather yeah, than yeah. lifting it from the ground, you're lifting it from, uh, from uh, something, something that's hovering yeah, down, yeah, just yeah. above it. Uh, so yeah, like I said, that's that's probably another one in terms of lower body and lower back uh, yeah. activation. That's a fantastic exercise. What number are we on now? Number seven. It's number seven now. Uh, number seven, I would probably say uh, bent over row. Again, phenomenal, phenomenal exercise. And to be fair, if you want a solid, thick back, yeah. a bent over row is probably one of the best exercises that you can do. In, purely in terms, of, again, from muscle activation and muscle fibers work. Yeah, but, uh, Amazing. Uh, a bent over row is a fantastic exercise. What are we neglecting here? So we've got shoulders, calves. Yeah, I was going to say number eight, I would say would probably be a 
barbell shoulder press or a dumbbell shoulder press. Again, fantastic movement. Yeah. Um, whether it's seated or standing, again, just, it's just down to preference. I nice. prefer I prefer seated. Um, just means you got less. There's less swing. Nice. Two more. Uh, number nine, I would say standing bicep curls. Okay. Um, again, in terms of yeah, just amazing exercise. And again, it's for me. I think you, you've asked that question, and I'm trying to answer that question based on where, irrespective of where you are. Leg yeah, press is probably right. the only one that you can't really do, but all the other, all yeah, the other yeah. exercises you can pretty much do anytime, anywhere from home or at the gym. Of course. Anything for hamstrings? Uh, hamstrings. Um, I'd probably say laying hamstring curls. Yes. Uh, is, yeah, is probably yeah. is probably probably the best for hamstring. Yeah. Um, there you go, man. Ten. And then, that's ten. And then yeah, and then ten. But yeah, in terms of other so exercises, there you go. Sakib's top ten exercises to maintain a healthy yeah. physique. Yeah. What's next for SPG? What's the future plans? Uh, for me, it's just continuing to help as many people as I possibly can, um, whether that's in the UK or whether that's abroad. Alhamdulillah, over the last you know six and a half seven years now, managed to got clients in Dubai. Qatar, Germany, France, um, obviously England, of course, yeah, yeah. or UK, of course, England, Scotland. Um, so yeah, in terms of reaching out as many people as I possibly can, opening yeah. that network up and essentially giving people a platform where they can get into the best shape of their life without sacrificing the social life, the, the relationships, the favorite food that they like. So for me, just continuing to grow that is one. Secondly, I'll probably say, um, Looking to uh, launch an ebook, probably the start of uh, start of start of next year. And thirdly, as well, it's something that I did last week. Actually, um, it was in a planned trip. I actually went out to uh, to Morocco. I read an article where there was a school teacher who lost thirty two uh, children of mm. the ages of, I think it was seven to eleven. And it struck a struck a it struck a chord with me. And it's something that I do at the start of every year is set goals that I want to achieve. And I will look at them every single month without fail. And when I was looking at the goals I set out to achieve this year, doing more charity work was actually one of them. Um, so I made the decision based on that article and I looked at that as well. I was like, I'm going to go. And I've got a friend as well, uh, Wakas. A uh, big shout out to Wakas as well. Amazing guy. So we went out together and Alhamdulillah, you know, put out a page, just giving page. We managed to raise, I think it was about six and a half K. Wow. Um, you know, within the space of about four days. Amazing, man. And I'm able to help so many people. I want to say some people, in particular, there's 243 people, and we've we've pledged for another 100 uh, families as well in terms of providing um, food, uh, emergency, uh, sorry, emergency food parcels and also winter blankets, and we've also pledged towards 100 uh, winter essentials as well. But I think, you know, you want to be not necessarily known as being somebody who's successful. You also want to be known as being a good person and being a good Muslim as well. Um you know, some are better than others. You know, I'm still on that. I'm still on that journey of being a better Muslim myself, uh, and that's something that. that, and that is something that I'm as, uh, aspiring towards. Um, but yeah, I think being able to be in a position whereby we're very fortunate that we live in the West. You know, we, you know, we're we're, we're very fortunate in, in that we could quite easily be in the position of, for example, the, the people who lost their lives and their livelihoods in you know the, the, the Atlas Mountains in Morocco could quite easily be in that same position ourselves. It's yeah. just down to the geographical location that we're here and they're there. Yeah. Um, and if we're not able to help when we're in a position to do so, then I feel like we failed. So, Alhamdulillah, you know, we're, we're in a position whereby we can. And I th just think it's important to not necessarily just be good at your job, but also to be a good person as, and help as many people as you can. And whether that's the less fortunate, then we should all aim towards at least doing something. Oh, and I think if we were to do that collectively across the globe, then the, yeah. world, the world would be a better place. That's an amazing message, man. I love that, brother. Um, what's the best way to reach out to yourself to get coached? Um, to be fair, you can go through the uh, www.strictlybodygains.com right. inquire through there. Instagram's, pro Instagram's probably the easiest. Yeah. Um, there, or you can just email us um, strictlybodygains at gmail.com so any any one of them is, uh, is completely fine but yeah Instagram is probably going to be the easiest or if they've not got Instagram then just directly through the uh, directly through the website but I think the biggest thing is that the longer you leave it the harder it gets and I say this about everything in life you know if you if you if you if you want to get started get started now don't wait until three years or five years because it's only going to become more difficult mm. and I suppose that's not necessarily just with your health but that's with anything in life yeah. If you're going to do it, do it today. Don't wait until 2047. 20, 20, it's just pointless. It's what this podcast is about, man. Tie your camel, basically. <laughs> Take action and tie your camel, man. Absolutely. Get in touch. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that.
Sakib, it's been absolutely amazing having you on the podcast, brother. Well, thank you so much for Honestly, having me as well. I feel like we could have gone on for another hour. I know. To be fair, I'm genuinely shocked when I looked over the time. <laughs> I'm like, I was like, it can't have been 15 minutes and then looked at it and been an hour and 15 minutes. But yeah, yeah, no, no, it is, it is what it is, man. Um, yeah, and I look forward to bringing this out, man, honestly. And I have a feeling we're going to do it again in the future oh, no, as well. Anytime, man. anytime. And thank Show you, me. honestly, Jenny, uh, yeah. thank you so much for having me as well. It's been an absolute pleasure. And you've been uh, a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful host as well. Thank you so much, brother, honestly. Um, with that being said, if you enjoyed the podcast, don't forget to leave a comment, like, and subscribe. It helps the channel more than you know. With that being said, we'll see you in the next one. Peace.